Well, ladies and gentlemen, we managed to have a little technical snag there. We have often heard that make hay when sun shines, but I think it's time to make hay when things go haywire. So firstly, our sincere apologies for that, but we hope that we uh, do get the proceedings right from here on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on that note, as we had heard even before, uh, the ET Best Brands has come up with the research initiative undertaken by Economic Times, also initiated by the research agency Nielsen. Now, this is where they went ahead uh, to take a about a survey that was spanned across 16 cities with a design sample of 13,120 uh, people. That's what we're talking about. Uh, these are the ones uh, who have, in fact, uh, belonged to different sections. They are the ones who have belonged to socioeconomic uh, groups, A, B, C. And uh, in this particular survey, we come up with the top 400 brands uh, that were selected as the top brands based on the market reach as well as the visibility spend. Now, each brand, as we all know, is a winner and has done something very unique to actually be there. But this evening, we've decided to take it together and compile the list of top 250 brands. We have, in fact, brought together some of the category winners as well as some of the leaders in the compilation as a form of the coffee table book. And, in fact, some of them were even humble enough to share their winning strategies with all of us. So this special moment we'd like to share with all of you uh, with the unveiling of the coffee table book. Now, we all have uh, very well heard of the fact that life is not measured by the number of the breaths that we take, but in instead uh, uh, by the moments that take our breath away. Now, if we have to fondly recollect a great moment in the year 1999, well, not just me, not just you, but every very, very, I would say, enthusiastic Indian cricket fan would remember 1999 to be a year of spectacle. I mean, when you talk about perfect and you can think about this renowned uh, person, was actually accomplished so much. In fact, talking about his accomplishments, I must say they're nothing less than stunning. An Arjuna awardee and a Padma Shri award winner. With every ball that he's bowled, he's been unstoppable. And with every wicket that he's taken, he's been unmatchable. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening, we are truly, truly honored to have the presence of our chief guest. Can we have a huge round of applause as I invite on stage the cricketing legend, Mr. Anil Kumble. Mr. Deepak Lamba to please join Mr. Anil Kumble on the days. Welcome, sir. Humbly request him to unveil the coffee table book for all of us this evening. Coffee table book. One more time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamba. Thank you very much, Mr. Swami. Well, uh, what can I say? I'm sure all of us are waiting with bated breath to hear from our cricketing legend, Mr. Anil Kumble. Can we have one more time a huge round of applause? Over to you, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me congratulate all the brand leaders and all the winners this evening. When I received the invitation from Economic Times to speak at this forum, especially on a topic that said carrying your own brand, I was understandably curious and intrigued in the same breath. This is a forum where the industry's best brand leaders are gathered and I am quite removed from knowing principles of branding. Of course, if you wanted me to talk about how not to spin the ball for 18 years and yet be branded 
India's leading spinner, I could tell you a thing or two. It's a feeling a bit like I do each time I step out to bat. I decided to learn something about brands and more importantly about myself in that context. I came across several definitions of brand per se in business, marketing and advertising. And in simple terms, it's a collection of features that identifies one product from another distinctively. People as brands is not a new concept. In fact, that is the foundation of product brands. We first started identifying people distinctly from one another through their names and personalities. When the personal identifiers became much more overt and well known, like with famous or infamous people, we consider them to be people brands. When I was starting out in cricket, we used to observe several characteristics in celebrity cricketers that I now know was their personal brand. For instance, there was the on-field persona of certain cricketers seen as aggressive and blunt, while others were considered stylish and classy. In fact, more often than not in India, you straight away get branded for what you are not. As a batsman, if you have made your debut at the international level, and then after a few games, you tend to get branded saying, oh, he can't play the fast ball, he can't play the bouncer, and if you are a bowler, no, he can't play on these kind of pitches, he can't do this, he can't do that. So it's all about someone not being able to do anything. Off-field, the era of mass media was speaking, and TV took celebrity brand endorsers to a whole new level. There were cricketers who were projected to be well-groomed, suave ladies' men, and others who were academically oriented, intellectuals, the serious types. It was, and is a default status for a cricketer in India, to be known by millions and millions of people. Having a personal brand, thus, was not really a plan. It was just thrust upon us. What the brand was to look and act like and be known for, however, seemed like something we could have a say in. There existed several stereotypes that cricketers would fit, fit into. For instance, fast bowlers were deemed aggressive, whereas spinners were not. I probably didn't fit into most of those stereotypes. Not because I tried not to, but simply because I wasn't trying to fit. I did, after all, try my hand at pace bowling, discarding it for spin at the beginning of my career. I had the height and gait for a pacer too. I wasn't quite gripping the ball the way I was supposed to for a leg spinner. Whereas I was getting pace and bounce, I wasn't focusing on that one perfect delivery with the unique action. Rather, I was trying and bowling six different balls each over. In every sense of cricketing definitions in those days, I was unorthodox. However, at the end of my career, when I look back, I somehow had earned myself the reputation of a solid, consistent, straight-laced bowler. I don't think too many from my generations think of me as a maverick or non-conformist. That's when I realized my personal brand had been forming on its own over two decades in ways that weren't always controlled by me. As I mentioned, the product endorsement market with celebrities was growing and cricket was gaining prominence in that. I had received a fair share of advice on what to do to be signed up by more brands. Someone said, take off the glasses. Others said, shave off the moustache. Some quite adventurously said I needed a ponytail, a tattoo, an earring, etc., etc. I just couldn't get myself to do all these things and by not branding myself, I had inadvertently branded myself. Despite a two-decade career, my brand endorsements were relatively few. Today, you play five matches 
and someone signs you up for a three-year contract. I also said no to a few that did come by, hardly because of any deeper brand insight I had, but simply because I didn't feel a connect with the product that I was required to endorse. It's also interesting how events come together to make your brand take shape. Before 2002, I was probably seen as a geeky South Indian, academically oriented, and a slogger, and bringing the same approach to cricket. The 10 wicket haul against Pakistan was considered one of those things that was about discipline and doggedness. After bowling in West Indies with a broken jaw, I was suddenly transformed into this Mr. Tough Guy, macho, can take one on the chin and keep going types. A few years later, when the eventful tour of Australia happened and I had made some strong statements as I was leading the team, there was once again a revision of perception. And I heard this time I was the guy who could give it back, a statesman, etc., etc. I must admit quite honestly that I didn't plan on doing anything differently in any of these instances. These things just happen. I remained who I always was and did what I thought was appropriate for each situation. And the, and the perception of my brand seemed to morph a bit each time to accommodate the new piece of information. However, one thing remained the same. The endorsement offers didn't come knocking just because I took to wickets or bowled with a broken jaw or took on the Aussies. Media is an instrument of building and communicating personal brands. In our playing days, the only way the fans could build perception was through our on-field behavior, largely and from what the media reported about us. The occasional interview allowed us to express ourselves, but the territory of this was largely confined to the questions asked and the answers permitted. If we were intimated then, we are petrified today. Social media has flung your personal brand out there, open to the elements, accepting, validating, refuting, shattering perceptions. Anyone can ask you anything. Everyone can see how you respond. Within a span of 140 characters, people have turned from adulated heroes to reviled villains. Pardon us if we are reluctant to get out there. In recent years, personal branding seems to be much more prevalent. I recently read somewhere that the share of celebrity-led campaigns in total ad volumes has reached 64% in 2013. My own sports company, Tenvik, had done an extensive research with consumers and from the market on sports celebrities as endorsers. A couple of years ago, and uh, Times of India had covered the same. I learned that leading sports person in India had dozens of active brand endorsements at one point in time. Imagine that, so many brands all telling their consumers that India's celebrity sports persons either prefer them or use their product or share values with their brand. Of course, the IPL is one of the most talked of phenomena in sport in recent times and it would be wanting if I didn't say something about it here. Cricketers, as personal brands, have valuations here, and these valuations are essential in selecting players and formulating strategies towards the brand's very purpose, winning the coveted cup for the franchise they are associated with. However, I wonder if the valuations of IPL cricketers are led purely by this objective, or are they also colored by some extent by their packaging. The business of sport means that franchisees have revenue objectives and winning is only one, a relatively small source of revenue. If player A's personality and fan base can attract a few extra sponsors as a franchise leader, would you not be tempted to spend a few thousand dollars for that particular player? Personal brands are probably acquiring a whole new level of importance here. I think it will resonate with this audience when I say that every brand's success is determined by how relevant and powerful its connect is with its consumer or customer. Lately, 
have begun to wonder if personal brands are doing a good job in identifying the customer correctly, especially in the case of young sports persons. When you're starting out in your sporting career, your personal brand really needs to be determined by how good a sports person you're turning out to be, technically or even mentally. Your consumer or customer in this case has to be the game of cricket and the people who will decide that you play the next match and the next and so on. You have to build your personal brand with them and this has to go beyond the packaging. Connecting with the consumer of a soft drink brand or a t-shirt brand might seem like a very easy and attractive option. But at the end of the day, a sports fan spends money to watch you play and win for your country and not because you did a great job in the soft drink commercial. He's there because he believes in the promise you as a sportsman have made on the field. Of course, retirement comes hard to everyone and suddenly, especially to a sports person. You have to figure out how you plan to spend the rest of your productive life. Since I have retired from playing cricket, I have tried to keep busy with a bunch of things. Support and, ad and management roles in cricket, in administration and in business. There is essentially one difference between the founders of some of your organizations and me. You all had a business and then built a brand from it. When I retired, I had a brand and I ventured to build a business. That's the story of Tenwick, our company, wherein I've tried to keep my vision and actions in line with my personal brand. Here again, I confess I've been a bit of a non-conformist. I got into something that didn't have a template. I don't think it still does. Where do you go and learn about the business of grassroots sports in India? What industry exists that I could have learned from, applied best practices from, recruited people from? Even funding was a challenge because investors couldn't compare the Tenwick business plan to any industry standard, any competitor, any market model. So I started with what I knew. We have a serious gap in sports development of the grassroots in India. And from knowing the gaps, I could define the solutions. Together with my friend and contemporary in the world of sport, a former national champion, table tennis champion, Vasan Bharadwaj, and I went about defining the offerings, finding the right people, getting the right expertise. Today, over three years since the corporate team came together and we kicked off the business, I can see that not only have I transformed the personal into business, but Tenwick is also having a deep impact on who I am and shaping my personal brand. I've received a fair share of advice on building my brand in the last four to five years about staying relevant. However, I've simply been following one principle. If it doesn't match your personal brand, don't do it. Recently, there were two opportunities that the marketing team reached out with. One was to be a participant in a dance reality show and the other was to share my stubble in the Delhi Metro. I was both mystified and amused by them. Was that what my being relevant meant? Equally on the other side, I was strongly suspicious of my ability to do something positive and enhance their desired perception of their brand for both these clients and hence politely decline. I'm trying to simply do what I can and if in the process I can impact someone or make a positive change to something, it thrills me. When an economic times calls me to deliver this talk, it's not because I have worked hard to be seen as someone who can give speeches to the stalwarts of corporate India. It's merely because there happen to be people and brands like ET who seem to find a fit and an audience for something that I can anyway speak about. Till such time that there are brands that see a fit for me, I'm happy to remain relevant. Thanks for uh, patiently listening to my thoughts. I think a wiser man would have simply said, carrying your own brand is all about discovering and having the confidence to be your own self. Thank you so much. Sir, but I'm going to request you to please stay back because I believe some of us have some questions to ask you. And if you would permit, sir. Yeah, sure. Superb. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you may please raise your hands. We shall pass on the mics to you and please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, Anil. Uh, Karthik here from Tata Motors. Uh, we've been a big fan of uh, you playing all, we followed all your career. 
uh, it's, it's this IPLization of each sport that we are seeing today. Uh, Kabaddi, you take soccer, lesser known sports with regards to India are the more popular ones. Uh, what do you think, is, is this just a passing trend or a fad right now and do you think, does it benefit corporates more and advertising companies more than the grassroots uh, sports person who is probably uh, trying to do something in that particular sport, your thoughts on that? No, as a sports, a sports person, I am delighted that uh, you know, the other sports are getting its due and without corporate support, without television and without the fan following, I don't think you can have any sport uh, that is marketable and, and sustainable. So I'm really glad that, uh, you know, uh, soccer, uh, then kabaddi, uh, you know, hockey and every other sport is now getting its due. But having said that, you know, it's all about creating icons. If we have to uh, build on, on cricket as an example, and if you have to get better at, at performing at the international level in sport, then I think we need to start creating icons in other sports as well and then trying to emulate them. I mean, the reason that cricket is popular is because there's a touch and feel about uh, Sachin Tendulkar or a Rahul Dravid or a VVS Lakshman, you can relate to them. And when they play domestic cricket, you can relate to them. But whereas in other sports, it's always the Maradonas and the Pele's that we, that we relate to. I mean, we need to start relating to a Baichan Bhutia and then we start relating to a Mary Com. And that's when I think, you know, Indian sport will come together. And corporate support is extremely important. And I strongly feel that, you know, it's not just a passing phase. Yes, it, there needs to be a beginning, and I'm really glad that it has started. All of it is starting at the same time, so which means that it's a good time for Indian sports. And I strongly believe that with all your support and with the media, and then I'm sure there's a lot of uh, fan following for every sport. And there is, there is a place for every sport. In fact, you know, my young daughter, who's eight years old, followed the Pro Kabaddi League and I had to literally ask her, saying, you know, which are the teams and who are the players, and she followed it. So, which means that, you know, there's a huge following for every sport. So, I'm, I, I don't think that this is just a passing phase. I believe strongly that, you know, for this to sustain, it's not just the uh, television, uh, you know, tournaments that you need to conduct. There needs to be a strong influence of the grassroots for you to develop the actual sport. And that's where I think we as a company are, are involved in trying to create a culture at the school level which becomes second nature to everyone. And if not, you become a sportsman, at least your lifestyle is better. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Rupendra from GSK, very big fan of yours and I think thank you so much for an ins inspirational speech today. Thank uh, you. Just, uh, you know, very curious thing because, you know, for the first time when you had, uh, you know, I was like rooting for somebody not to take wicket for India was when you had taken nine wickets against Pakistan. And, you know, I don't remember who was bowling on the other side, but I was just vying for, you know, you to come and bowl. What were those thoughts in your mind when, you know, you were kind of going through that process and, you know, when you had taken nine wickets? And no, I ensured that I could influence my captain to bowl my best friend at the other end. Javagal Srinath was the other bowler, so, so he, was, he was very, uh, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he tried hard not to bowl at the stumps, which is not easy as a bowler, because you're trained, you know, uh, day in, day out, uh, from a young age as a bowler, to bowl at the stumps. And then suddenly you go to a bowler and say, I want you to bowl three feet wide of the stumps. It's not easy. So he managed to do that. And then, you know, it would have been really embarrassing for me to ask him to do another time. So that's when I realized that if at all I was destined to get my 10th wicket, it had to be in that particular over. And it so happened that, uh, you know, I did eventually get that 10th wicket. So it was just destiny. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful to Srinath. Every, every, everybody plays a role. I mean, it's not just my wicket. Somebody has to take a catch. And, of course, you need to, uh, you know, hit the ball on the pad and influence decisions and, and get the umpire uh, to give you the decisions as well. So, so all, all of that, you know, uh, happened on that particular day and then, you know, picked up Tenfa and it was probably destiny. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Anil. Amar from Blackberry. Uh, you played a different brand of cricket for the longest time of your career and then towards the fag end, you know, the brand of cricket started changing. 
Now, this is very similar to what happens in business. There's a certain trend, and then that completely changes. How is it that you manage to adapt to keep to the pace of the IPL and you know the brand of cricket that's changing today? Yeah, it was very different. Uh, obviously, you know, all of us wanted to be a part of the T20 format. Uh, you know, I mean, when I when I started in 2008 uh, playing in the IPL, I just looked at myself and said. I just need to bowl four overs. I mean, it used to take me four overs to warm up because, you know, I was not young when I started playing IPL. So it really took my arm to feel good after about four overs. And here my spell was over. And then I, you know, if you look back at, at my test career, uh, I think on an average I bowled close to 55 overs in a test match. And here I was, you know, you bowl 64 overs, you finish the tournament. So, uh, so it was all very uh, tough for, for you to adapt. But I think the adaptation has to happen in the mind more than, more than anything else. I think skill-wise, you know, if you've played for 25 years, you don't need anything else to, to actually uh, counter any kind of batsman. Because you've done all that through your life. It's all about you know, trying to tweak the mind and saying, listen, I think you need to start <coughs> getting used to one-over spells rather than 15 over spells. So that's the change of mindset that I needed. And similar, similar to me, I think even the batters who were brought up in my era, because we all grew up playing the longer format and then the shorter format, rather than how the younger lot are now being groomed. You know, they first play the T20 and then start playing the one dayers and then eventually the four day and five day test matches. So. So that's the challenge for them. It's the challenge for them is now to adapt to the longer version. For us, the challenge was to adapt. And it's all mental. It's not about skill. If you have the skill, you'll be able to easily adapt to any form of, form of the game. So I'm sure even in business, it's all about you know, change in mindset rather than your own skill sets. I'm sure you have the skill set. It's just accepting that uh, you, know, you have to uh, adapt and, and play. Yes, that was one part. And the other part of... The IPL is, is you know, post-match as well. So, I mean, you know, late, late evenings, late nights, you finish the game at 12 o'clock, and then by the time you, you uh, settle down, it's 2.30. And that's the other, uh, you know, bit that I had to adapt, which probably is second nature for, to all the youngsters of today. Uh, so, so that is something which I had to adapt as well. So it's all in the mind, not, not really uh, skill-based. It was all about getting getting through in the mind and saying, okay, this is something that I need to accept. Thank you. This lady wants to. Hi, I'm Swati from Godrej. It's been a pleasure listening to you. Um, the transition that you made from your cricketing days to setting up your own company, what was that one thing that you really found difficult and how did you face that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it was always easy to, uh, to let, I mean, even, even outside of the game, I mean, if uh, not necessarily critique or not necessarily people who came up to you and said, I don't think you can do this, it was easy for me to answer all those while I was playing cricket. I think it's a lot tougher when you're not uh, in the middle and managing a business. So, so and, and this... Uh, business that we started was unique as well so there's no uh, you know, template that we could follow so it was all new for us it was a learning experience for all of us and and in that journey I think you know cricket is like life so you deal with situations on the field you tend to take the ups with the with the lows and that's exactly how you deal with business as well so for me it was all about starting from you know my debut so that's how I started in business and I think now I've just made a comeback uh, into the team and I think I'm pretty much on the road to now start performing so I think that's the that's that's where I am with regard to my business and that's how I deal with every any any life situation I mean I always look back and and I, as a sportsman you're extremely competitive and uh, you have a pretty big ego you don't want to accept that easily but having said that, I think all these qualities, uh, you know, do come in handy. And, and like I said, you know, most of you have businesses and you create a brand. And here I was, 
starting off as a brand branded cricketer into business so i had to start figuring out how to deal with business and and i think over the last 4 years we have done pretty well and all the learnings that i had from the cricket field have certainly helped in business thanks best thank wishes you. thank you Hi Anil, my name is Shripat and uh, I head an uh, advertising agency. I have a question for you. Uh, many a times we see in the corporate world as we go higher up the ladder, there is a lot of stress that people go through. And uh, a lot of people have advised uh, people at the top, top that you know at least you get engaged into one or the other kind of sports to de-stress yourself. So uh, we have seen a lot of interest from the corporate in sports uh, from an advertising perspective. but. What role do you see sports have in the life of a corporate or a corporate uh, senior corporate executive? No, I think it's a great uh, stress buster. I mean, you you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you know, sport is something where even as sportsmen, you know, when you when you feel stressed, for me, photography was was a stress stress buster. So if in between matches, if I had to relax, I just picked up my camera and then just went away. So I guess you know, f for people in the corporate world who are mostly sitting down in meetings and working, uh, you know, sitting down on chairs. I think it's important to be active. And the moment you start sweating, and, and for me, even as a cricketer, I mean, for me, uh, the greatest stress buster was just going on a long jog. And, and that to me, you know, when you come back refreshed, although at the start you feel jaded, you don't want to push yourself, but I think once you start getting into a routine and it becomes a habit, I think that's when you start enjoying it. And then uh, it's not just that, but also getting out there and then, you know, uh, 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 getting to... And, and the other, other major thing that possibly can help is that in sport, there's no hierarchy. You know, although you're a captain, you know, if you drop a catch, you're still treated the same uh, on the field by a bowler. And, and similarly, in, in the corporate world, I mean, it's a great initiative if all, of, all the juniors, seniors, middle management, all of you can come together as a team and play a sport. No better way. I mean, we did try this out in a, in a wildlife environment. And it was great to see a junior staff actually shouting at a senior because he, he fumbled or he misfielded. So, so these kind of things you only see in sport. You'll never see in a boardroom where, you know, someone junior is screaming at the senior. So I don't, I, I don't think that's possible. So, so in, a, in sport, it's possible. And that's the beauty about sport, where it engages people, you get to know each other better. And that's probably one reason to, to engage all, you know, all you uh, corporate, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to sport. And, and no better way than sport to get people together, talk about it. And you know, I certainly encourage that. Hi, Anil. One question from me. Yeah. yeah. Um, wanted to talk to you about your uh, leadership experience. Uh, the time that you captained the team, uh, the Indian team was had a lot of personalities, larger than life personalities. Some of them senior, some of them even though they were junior were larger than life personalities. So how did you sort of get different individuals to function as a team? Because we did really well on that, especially yeah. that Australian talk. <laughs> no, I did, I, did, I did say in my talk that you know, uh, some of the larger than life personalities are created, uh, you know, outside of the cricket field as well. But, yeah, I mean, to be fair, I, I did say this recently, uh, that I was probably by default as captain of India, because uh, when I was, uh, you know, given the captaincy, not, nobody wanted it. Uh, basically, all the senior players said, no, I think we have done our bit, so it's for somebody else to take the lead. And I knew that, you know, at, at that time, that I wouldn't be playing for too long, so it was just a transition. And I had to just manage the, uh, manage the team in that period, and I was only captain for test matches. And, and like you said, rightly said, that you know, there were five captains in my team. One was uh, the current one-day captain, and four or five of them were former captains uh, who were all playing with me. And, and one thing I did right through my career was I never felt that I was not a leader. I always contributed to the team's uh, uh, you know, strategies. I was al always a part of the think tank. And whether I was playing, whether I was not playing, I was always a part of the core group. So I never felt that I was not a leader. And possibly, you know, by doing that and then taking certain initiatives on behalf of the team, I mean, whether it was, uh, you know, the player's contract or whether it was 
uh, players' uh, advertising rights during the ICC in 2002-2003. I mean, I, all that, uh, you know, I took the lead. And maybe all those reasons helped me, uh, you know, engage with my, with my uh, colleagues much better because, you know, and, and also the mutual respect was always there. I mean, not just the cricketing part of it, but also, like I mentioned, you know, I was a part of the core group irrespective of who the captain was. So I think this helped me deal with uh, whatever constraints that one may perceive that uh, you may have in this kind of a situation. And the other, uh, I think, most important factor in, in any leadership is to lead by example. And if you walk the talk, then I think most people respect you. And, and that's exactly what, uh, what I tried to do, in, in whether I was a, a player or whether I was a captain. So that way, I think, you know, the entire team rallied around me, especially during tough times uh, in Australia. So, so I could get the respect of the team during tough times. I think that was my role and I was only playing it for a year and once I knew that I had done that job, I'm not someone who you know, likes to just be a hanger on. So I'd like to do my job and, and get on with my life. So, and that's exactly what I did and I'm really glad that Indian cricket from there on has, has done remarkably well and it's in safe hands and I'm really glad that you know, we've been able to win uh, World Cup after that and there's another World Cup coming up, so I'm hoping that you know we will be able to repeat that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, any further questions? Well, then on that note, it's time to give another thunderous round of applause one more time for Mr. Thank Amal Kumble. Thank you so much. And so I'm going to request Mr. Deepak Lama to please come on stage and uh, present a small token of gratitude to Mr. Amal Kumble for his valuable presence this evening. And I'm also going to request... Uh